Chapter 15. Micro Island. Three hours later, we had traveled some 3,700 miles and were approaching the northeastern shore of Micro Island. This large semi-tropical Pacific island had risen out of the ocean during the cataclysmic earth changes of the late 20th century. It was about half the size of 1976's Australia. The Macro Society maintained a well-protected base on this eastern coast from which it carried on most of its contacts with the island's interior. Carol had explained that this base, where we were planning to land, was completely protected by an invisible forest field which had effectively resisted all attempts to breach it. Now as we came in sight of this macro society enclave, I was startled to see it surrounded on its landward side by thousands of people. What an enormous number of people, I exclaimed. Do the micro islanders usually gather in such numbers outside the macro society base? Well, not that I've heard of, Carol replied. In fact, Micro Island has a law against coming within ten miles of our base. They used to patrol this zone with policemen and dogs. Well, I said, either they repealed the law or there's been an awful lot of lawbreakers down there. The forest field was momentarily removed, and we descended into a clearing beside a gamma building, which was surrounded by a thousand acres of beautifully landscaped gardens and parkland with large swimming pools and recreation areas. As our transfer touched down, I saw a very tall man leaving the building and run down toward us. By the time we were on the ground, he had reached us, and Carol introduced me to Orion, the Gamma of this base. She had talked with him during the past week via CI video, so they seemed like old friends. Why the crowd? I asked. Orion answered, It seems that President Elgon Ten has proclaimed an island holiday in honor of your visit. He and his vice president, Sela Nine, are out there now waiting to greet you. I'm sorry there's no one else from the Macro Society here, but all the rest of our gamma is off in the interior using this holiday as an opportunity to tutor. But what happened to the law against coming within ten miles of this base? Carol asked. In honor of the occasion, Orion explained, Elgon rescinded it for a day. Well, why did they have a law like that in the first place? I inquired. That's easy to answer, Orion replied. Elgon and his assistants are afraid of our influence on their people. They don't want to lose anyone to the Macro Society, so any islander who's caught talking with a member of the Macro Society is punished severely. Are you that successful in getting results for the Macro Society from here? I asked. We might be if they didn't have that law. Even with it, we find about a hundred people each year who are ready to go back to the mainland. Looking at the crowd packed outside the invisible forest field, I was surprised at the number of very small children who were permitted to gather among such a crowd without supervision of their parents. Where are their parents of all those little ones? And why aren't they here looking after them? I asked Dorian. They're there, John, right among the children, he answered. You're just not used to seeing such large families. Here on Micro Island, birth control is strictly forbidden. It's not unusual to see families of 15 to 25 children. The more children a couple has, the greater their prestige. But why don't these people limit the size of their family to just the number of the children they can adequately clothe and care for? Just look at some of them, I remarked. Yes, I know, he replied. They're victims of their religions, which denounce birth control as a mortal sin. The fact is, however, that Elgon would change that if he thought it would serve his purpose. Of course it won't, for his purpose, publicly stated, is to outbreed the macro society so he can justly claim the mainland as his territory. Well, don't the women get tired of being pregnant all the time? Carol asked. Yes, indeed they do, Orion answered. In fact, one of our biggest problems with Elgon and his assistants is that they interfere with our distribution of birth control tablets for those who ask for them. You see, both Elgon and his assistants have highly developed telepathic and clairvoyant powers, so that if a man or a woman even desires birth control tablets in their presence, they are aware of it, and the individual is punished in the same manner as if he had talked to a Mac Society member. You probably know that our birth control tablets render the person infertile for anywhere from one to five years, depending on which tablet is taken. In a culture like this, it would be a blessing to be physically unable to bear children, Carol observed. Not really, Carol, he explained. You see, any woman who's unable to bear children is used as a prostitute and forbidden to marry. That really brands her, for marriage is highly revered here. The only cause, accepted for divorce, is a woman's inability to bear children. I guess if a woman wants a divorce, she just takes a pill, I commented. But if talking to a macro society member and taking birth control tablets are both against the law, how do people manage to get the tablets? They know we're telepaths, Orion answered. So all we have to do is pass among them on the street, thinking the request, and we'll teleport the tablet of her choice to her when no one is watching. The problem is that one of Elgon's thousand assistants sometimes intercepts a signal. 
Then the person is immediately dragged away to the nearest public square where, but then, I needn't tell you of their atrocities. You'll see them soon enough. My attention went back to the crowd outside the barrier, and I remembered that their president, Elegon, and their vice president, Sela, were waiting outside for us. I asked, Do you think it would be dangerous for Carol and me to go out and meet their president? Not immediately, he replied. They plan to give you a royal reception, show you what they believe are the virtues of micro-island existence, then try to persuade you to allow them to help you complete your time translation. Then, I said, I suppose they feel I'll be so grateful that I want to stay here forever among them, right? Or he looked at me very carefully for a moment before he said, They're very clever, and will use every trick they can think of to get you to allow them to complete your time translation. You see, they believe if this happens before you are level three, it will mean that you will regress in awareness and be unable to live happily in the macro society. Okay, I said. Then it becomes dangerous for us when they see that I have successfully resisted their persuasion to let them complete my time translation. We'll plan to return here just before that happens. I suddenly realized that Orion did not believe that would be possible and was vainly trying to hide his doubts concerning my success with micro-islanders. I found myself beginning to share some of his doubts, but I tried to put on a brave smile as I said, Well, maybe it won't turn out as badly as you think, Orion, but in any event, I must take the risk and grow from the results, whatever they might be. So if you be kind enough to open your force field, we'll go out and meet President Elgon and the crowd. He slowly nodded his assent, then walked with us to the beginning of the force field where he stopped and turned to us. Be sure to use the number as their last name. It's very important to them, as it represents the level of awareness they profess to have evolved to. Looking deeply into Carol's eyes, he lifted her hands to his lips and kissed them. I was somewhat surprised when he turned and gave me the same warm, affectionate farewell. Then he raised the force field and allowed us to step outside the protected area. Once we'd done this, both Carol and I could clairvoyantly see the force field return and knew that we now stood unprotected except by our own minds, before what looked like the entire population of Micro Island. As we stood uncertainly examining the vast throng of humanity that stood before us, a great cheering began, and out of the center of the crowd came two of the most dazzling individuals that I'd ever seen outside of a rock concert. They came closer and closer, and I could see a powerfully built man of at least six and a half feet in height and with massively handsome face as hard as though it had been chipped out of granite. He was dressed in white robes embroidered with blue, yellow, and green stones and thousands of what looked like sequins that sparkled in the noonday sun. This, I thought, must be the president of Micro Island, Elgon 10, formerly level 7 in the Macro Society some 80 years ago. He had regressed in awareness level, then added 10 to his name and declared himself a level 10. He had stopped wearing the aura reflecting tunic at the same time. My attention turned to the woman at Elgon's side, whom I knew must be Sela 9, the regressed level 6 who had been Elgon's alpha mate. Since I knew she had left the Max Society 70 years ago, I realized that she must now be well over 100 years old, yet she didn't look a day over 25. Her beauty was the lush, sexually stimulating glitter of a film star. She was so powerfully alluring that I felt my whole body tingle in response to the sight of her. Her costume was a stunning and lascivious creation that bared unnaturally large, firm breasts whose uptilted nipples were touched with a glistening red substance, while the upper part of her gown was little more than an open halter covered with the ermine-like fur sprinkled with green emeralds. The skirt was flowing red velvet slit to the waist on both sides to reveal the most voluptuously exciting legs I'd ever seen. Suddenly, Carol's soft laughter echoed through my mind as I heard her thinking to me, Hope you haven't forgotten about Leah and me already. With more effort than I thought it would take, I shifted my gaze from Sela to Carol and washed my mind in her fresh, clear loveliness. At last I managed a wry smile. Thanks for pulling me out before I drown. I was almost overwhelmed by lust for Elgon, Carol admitted. Then I realized there must be hundreds of his telepathic assistants in this crowd trying to telehypnotize us into believing that we can't live without the sexual pleasure of these two. So that's why... I began when Carol interrupted me with a warning, prepare your mind to be attacked and remember your last macro contact. I had just enough time to begin the process of macro contact recall when I felt the delicious contact of Sela's body pressed against mine and the incredibly exciting sensation of her wet tongue touching my lips, then slipping inside my mouth. Dimly I heard Carol's voice saying, please let me go, Algon. 
Your overly sexual greetings are not a part of our customs, as you well know. From somewhere deeper than my mind, I summoned the strength to push Celia gently but firmly away from me. She smiled a mocking smile, and I noticed that there were dangerous lights dancing hypnotically in her glorious eyes. They were darker than the darkest night of hell. It was not until then that I noticed her magnificent mane of glistening mahogany hair that fell to her waist in rich, graceful waves. "'Welcome to Micro Island,' Elgon said in a deep, resonant voice that I immediately recognized as being powerfully hypnotic. "'I'm Elgon Ten, president of Micro Island.' "'Thank you,' I managed to respond in a relatively calm voice. "'But if you don't want us to turn around immediately to seek sanctuary behind the force field, you'll have to end the hypnotic barrage.' Elgon locked his eyes with mine, and I felt suddenly as if I were teetering on the edge of a dangerous precipice. It took all of my deepest mind strength to overcome the lethal desire to fall into the abyss below. I wrenched my gaze away from his eyes and heard him laughing in a great booming voice. As I turned to Carol, he said, Have no fear, John Ten. You have just demonstrated tenth-level awareness by resisting not only the mind of Sela Nine and myself, but also the thousand telepathically linked minds who were sending their hypnotic suggestions to you. You have succeeded beyond anything we imagined, and I promise you we will make no more futile attempts to control your mind. You are John Ten, as truly as great as I. Master, Sela cried out and knelt before me. Let us show you our island, and truly answer all your questions so the misconceptions that C.I. has implanted in your mind can be balanced at last by the truth. I turned back to Elgon and said, All right, show us your island. Celia is back on her feet and shaking her head. The invitation to visit our island extends only to you, John Tin. I'm sorry, but I must insist on taking Carol with me wherever I go, I said, deliberately addressing this remark to Elgon and ignoring Celia. Elgon shrugged his powerful shoulders and said, our admiration for you, John Ten, is so great that we will bow to your wishes. Saying this, he made a signal to the crowd, which immediately parted, allowing us passage to where a large, open-top transair stood. Carol and I followed Elgon and Sela into the rear portion of this conveyance that appeared to have two drivers up front, separated from the six swivel-seated passenger compartment by a glass-like partition. We all took seats except Elgon, who remained standing to accept the cheers of the wildly shouting crowd as their vehicle moved slowly past. When we had left the crowd behind, the transfer rose about 300 feet off the ground and proceeded at a slow pace, possibly 50 miles an hour, toward the interior of the island. Elgon, after a last wave at the distant crowd, seated himself facing us and began telling us about Micro Island. I'll summarize its main features. Micro Island had a population of a little over 3 million and was divided into five states, each of which had its own language, religion, and color. When Elgon assumed the presidency of the island by virtue of his superior macro powers, he established firm territorial boundaries for the five states. The island was roughly circular in shape, and Elgon had divided it into five pie-shaped triangles which allowed the states to have a common center, a circle which covered an area of approximately 75 square miles belonging to Elgon as supreme leader. When I asked him why he permitted all the divisions into separate states, religions, races, and languages, he responded by saying, The history of the world has proven that man evolves fastest when he's divided so that conflict and competition can encourage growth. For a moment I thought he was being facetious, but then I saw the fanatical gleam in his eye and realized that he was dead serious. Oh, I know, he continued, that the macro societies brainwashed you into accepting the pious ideas of unity and love, but those are illusions at the micro level which we inhabit. If God had wished macro unity to exist at the micro levels, he would have arranged it that way. On this planet, we live in the micro level where conflict and competition are universal laws. Macro man, who denies these laws, has no place here and will eventually be forced into some other dimension. According to the macro philosophers, I replied, it is micro man who has been forced into other dimensions, as this planet has been upgraded from a micro one to a macro one. Those are lies, he said, perpetuated by the decadent macro beings trying to destroy the vitality and strength of micro man. But let me show you the exciting, interesting lives our people live, and you can compare their existence with the decadent life of the macro society. Elgon must have sent a telepathic message to the driver, for we suddenly swooped close to the ground so that Elgon could point out some of the many people working in the fields and some nearby factories, either in the factories, fields, or service jobs. Elgon bragged that Micro Man worked eight hours a day, six days a week, which kept him free from the lazy existence of the macro society. 
I questioned him about the people working in the fields and factories on a day which he himself had proclaimed a national holiday. He responded by saying that only in this area were people working so we could inspect their work if we wanted to. I declined. As we came very close to the workers in the field, I was surprised to notice the intense yellow color of their skin, as I remembered the crowds outside of Macro Society Base had been white. When I asked the Elegon about this, he explained that due to the sinful mixing of the races, the original colors were no longer pure, so they had used artificial dyes to provide the basic five skin colors, black, brown, red, yellow, and white. Their five states were named for those colors. Our transfer landed near a small town that reminded me of a rural community back in the 1900s. Elgon opened the door for us and said, We want you to go talk to the people of this village or any village you wish. We won't go with you, so you'll know the people aren't lying just to please us. While I had my doubts about how free the people would be to talk with us, I quickly accepted his offer and we were soon knocking on one of the first doors on the village outskirts. An elderly woman who looked to be about 70 opened the door. She said she'd seen our approach on TV and was proud to be the first we visited. She invited us into a small, sparsely furnished living room, and when we were seated on the hard metal chairs, they invited me to ask any questions I wished. Tell me about your life, I said. She smiled broadly, revealing ugly, twisted teeth, as she said, We live honest, decent, god fearing lives. Our men and women get married and stay married, and have lots of children and live in a home by themselves, not in some huge, evil hotel like they do on the mainland. Well, why do you dye your skin yellow, I asked. Because, she explained, my ancestors had yellow skin until the macro society polluted us with interracial marriage. Now we must dye our skins to remember our glorious racial heritage. You'll find our yellow state, with its yellow religion and yellow language, is the nicest state on our island. Wait a minute, I said. You're speaking the universal language of the macro society, not the yellow language. We learn the president's language in our schools and on television, she replied proudly but we speak only the yellow language in our homes and in our state activities. But why do you want two languages, I asked. People, she replied, can't be proud and hold their heads up if they have abandoned the language of their ancestors. Our yellow language makes our yellow people in our yellow state with our yellow religion the most unique people in all the world. Tell me about your yellow religion, I requested. She gave me another snaggle-toothed smile and said, According to our yellow religion, when God created man, he used five colors to distinguish the five different kinds of people. The yellow people God created last and best, and ever since the yellow race has been God's chosen race to show all the other races the godlike way to live. Up to now, Carol had been deliberately allowing me to ask questions. But now, she said, I recognize that you honestly believe what you are saying, and I feel that you have an intense dislike for us. Only for you of the macro society, not for this man, she said, looking scornfully at Carol. He has come from the great age of Microman, when the yellow race had a greater population than any other race. Elgon Ten, our president, says that he hopes you of the Macro Society have not yet corrupted John beyond saving. It is our responsibility to show him the truth. Leaving Carol with a look of disgust, she turned to me and smiled maternally as she continued, We remain true to the ancient virtues of religion, race, language, and the Micro family with its decent and respectable moral standards. Now she pointed at Carol with a gnarled finger and said, There stands the whore of ancient Babylon, living only for licentious pleasure, godless, childless, parentless, and doomed never to know the holy decency of marriage and the rearing of her own children. She and all her kind are an abomination to this earth. Soon God will destroy these wicked blasphemers. Thank you for talking with us, I said, but we'd better leave now. Your president is outside and we wouldn't want to keep him waiting. She walked us to the door, wishing happiness and truth for me and ignoring Carol. We returned to the trans and I asked to visit another state. We were soon in the air. A transportation top had been placed over the car so that we could travel at a very high rate of speed. On our journey to the next state, it was Celia's turn to regale us with the marvels of Micro Island. She began by pointing out to me that every individual had the right to have children and that women were faithful to their husbands. Tell me, Celia Nine, I said. Are you faithful to Elgon 10? She laughed and then said, I am not married because the macro society destroyed my ability to have children. According to CI, C9, you chose permanent sterilization and you could still choose otherwise. Carol inserted, CI also said that women who can't or won't bear children are treated as prostitutes here on Micro Island. Celia gave Carol a look of revulsion and then turned back to me with a smile and said, the Macro Society developed the greatest store of lies in all history and then built a machine called CI to disseminate them. Then you don't have prostitutes? I asked. Of course we have prostitutes, she replied. 
Biker man has always needed sexual variety. It's the oldest profession women have ever known. We are true to the ancient micro-customs, which permit man to have anything he's willing to pay for. Of course, like any other pleasures, it's illegal to patronize a prostitute. What do you mean, like other pleasures, I ask? Well, we have laws against many pleasures so that our people will appreciate them and work hard to earn enough money to afford them, Sila answered. You mean you encourage crime by passing laws that you know will be broken, I asked incredulously. Of course, she replied. Hasn't it always been so? It's one of our best sources of revenue. Besides, look at the history of the world. Crime is an essential ingredient in micro-life. It makes life exciting and interesting. After all, you can't have conflict and competition if you don't have the right kind of laws. You seem to mean that you and El Ganten have organized crime so that it benefits you and your followers, I commented. That's right, John Ten. That's how it's always been, she answered with a shrug of her shoulders that set her lush bare breasts to jiggling in a way I struggled to ignore. But it benefits everyone because our organized crime provides everyone who is willing to pay for it the most delicious pleasure of all, rebellion and revolt, which is what breaking the law is all about. Microman has always thrived on it. It's hard for me to believe that the two of you could have grown up in the macro society attained high levels of awareness and then given it all up for this, I remarked. But John 10, Celia cried out, we didn't give up our awareness. We developed it further. I am now level 9. Elgon is 10. You don't understand. What we left behind was only boredom. Here there is a delicious excitement of forbidden fruits being fought over and taken by the strong and courageous. I tell you, John 10, without pride and conflict, life is so deadly dull that it's not worth living. You must have forgotten, I said, that I came from the world of 1976 where conflict and competition were polluting and destroying this planet. We haven't forgotten, she said, that as long as competition and conflict were allowed to reign free, there was no great danger of pollution and overpopulation because the strong survived and the weak perished or lived lives of minimum consumption and pollution. But, I said, aren't all your assistants with macro powers called controllers, and aren't you limiting and controlling conflict and competition for your own interests? Of course we are, she replied candidly, because we are the strong, and the strong always control if they aren't shackled by a mythology of love, equality, and unity. You must recognize that no social organization, including your micro-society, can survive without cooperation, I stated. Yes, she agreed. We cooperate so that we can better enjoy the fruits of conflict and competition. Our conversation was interrupted at this point by our landing in a small town in the Red State. Carol and I got out and this time walked all the way through this community of generally small, unattractive houses. There were, however, a few larger homes, so we selected one of the largest and most ostentatious in the community. Before knocking on the door, Carol commented on the very few people we had seen on the streets, which were almost deserted. Before I could knock on the door, it was opened by a short, middle-aged man with a large, well-fed stomach and bright red skin. He welcomed us into a large and lavishly appointed living room, saying that everyone was watching our progress on the TV, interspersed with the gladiator games from the capital city of Algonia. Well, I said as we sat down in luxurious, comfortable, form-hugging chairs, I suppose that accounts for the absence of people outside, but tell us about the gladiator games you mentioned. His face lit up, and he grinned broadly, revealing a beautiful set of obviously false teeth. They're great, he said. Our state gladiators represent us in the games. This gives us a chance to demonstrate our superiority. You mean red gladiators fight gladiators of other colors, I asked? Yes, he replied, but we have many types of competition besides the individual sword fights, fist fights, or wrestling that gladiators performed in the past. We have team conflicts that include football, baseball, and basketball, as well as larger conflicts such as the capture of the flag. Well, I said, I remember playing a game by that name when I was a boy. How does your version go? When we practice it locally, he explained, we use few gladiators, but when it involves interstate competition, the standard team size is 100 men who play on the standard field size of 1,000 square yards. The object of the conflict is to capture the other state's flag. We use both sword teams and barehanded teams. You mean that you actually kill each other in these contests, I asked? Of course, he replied, but since the gladiators can wear armor in the sword contests, not very many are killed, only 10 or 12 a week, but they're still the most exciting contests we have. How often, Carol asked, do you watch these games? Well, since we work six days a week, we must attend church on Sunday morning. That leaves our evenings and Sunday afternoons to watch the games, he replied. My God, I exclaimed, don't you tire of watching that much fighting? He laughed, then said, 
There's one thing that we redmen never tire of, and that's fighting. But isn't that sort of brutality against your religion? I inquired. The red religion holds that God created four races of men and was disappointed, he explained. Then he created the red race to fight for the glory of God. We are the chosen race to lead all other races by our dedication, courage, and our loyalty to our race and to God. Sounds strangely familiar, Carol commented quietly to me. A scoff, if you like, decadent woman, he replied angrily. But our women are proud to bear us warriors, and they are decently married to one man. Sensing that it might be wise to change the subject, I asked, as a representative of the chosen red race, how do you manage to accept a leader like Elgon, whose skin is not naturally red? Well, it's true that his redness doesn't show, he exclaimed. But the soul of our president is red. He wears his skin white in sympathy for the weakness of the white race. Then how do you know his soul is red, I asked. Because when we asked him, he replied that he would never deny it, was his response. That Elgon was a sly one, I thought to myself. Then I decided to ask one more question before leaving. Tell me, I said, what do you do that allows you to live in such a large home in such luxury? I was hoping you would ask, he said, grinning proudly. You see, on Micro Island, courage, hard work, and a good head for business are rewarded. When I was young, I was the most famous gladiator on the island, and I earned a great deal of money, which I invested in land and various business ventures. Today, I own half the houses in our village and most of the acreage surrounding it. Aren't you afraid, Carol asked, as she glanced at the valuable articles in the room, that you might be robbed of some of your wealth? He laughed rather scornfully and said, We believe in the value of personal property, so we have law and order. Every tenth person on our island is a police official, and we take great pride in our ability as crime fighters. I myself was appointed personally by President Elgon, ten, as one of the top law officers in our red state. Carol couldn't help but insert, Mike Royal Island is the only place in the world where police are needed because it's the only place in the world where crime exists. If you didn't place so much importance on personal properties, you wouldn't need to waste all that manpower on policing your people. The fat red face of our host grew even redder as he glowered at her, saying, Great personal wealth has always gone to the strong, courageous, and clever people who are willing to take the risks and live exciting and rewarding lives. Now he sneered openly at Carol as he said, your macro society has destroyed all sense of decency or pride in its members by encouraging every vice imaginable, by denying all the virtues, courage, loyalty to one's race, accumulation of personal wealth. Getting to his feet and waddling furiously about the room, he shouted, Never in the history of our world has such evil, wicked godlessness been permitted to flourish. But God is not mocked forever. You and your godless, cowardly breed will soon perish from the face of this earth. I figured we'd better leave before our host worked himself into some sort of an apoplectic stroke. I thanked him for his time and hastily took our leave, and arrived back at the transair feeling rather depressed at what our host had revealed to us. There was no doubt in our minds that he fervently believed the things that he had told us. No one had forced us to choose his home to visit. Once we were airborne again, Algon began questioning me about our impressions so far. When I told him quite honestly that I had been depressed by what I had seen, he seemed genuinely sad and shook his great head of long curly black hair back and forth a number of times before he said, I'm sorry to hear that the macro society has already so poisoned your mind against us that you can't see how proud and happy our people are living free and decent lives. Elgon 10, I asked, do you really think that everyone, even the poor and unhealthy, is happy here on Micro Island? Elgon replied in an extremely sincere and persuasive manner, saying, What you don't understand, John Ten, is that the most important thing for a man is not wealth or health or even fame or personal pride, the feeling that he is better than the others. He paused now, letting this sink into my mind before continuing. We here on Micro Island have provided man with the opportunities for personal pride, his own family, his own race, his own religion, his own language, his own property, and his own state. All of these, the macro society has denied man, and by so doing, reduced the life of its members to a state of such monumental boredom that they don't care whether they live or die. They come to Micro Island and break our laws so they can have at least the satisfaction of dying in an exciting way, even if they can't live that way. Now it was my turn to shake my head. I'm sorry, but I just can't see it that way, Elgon. I don't ask you to believe what I say, he responded. Just believe what your eyes and ears tell you. Talk to more of our people. Talk to the poor ones. Talk to what you call the losers in our system. Why, I tell you the most miserable cowardly loser on our island has more self-pride and joy in living 
than any person you'll ever meet in the macro society, but don't take my word for it. See and hear for yourself. I agreed to do as Elgon suggested and talk with some more of the people. So he dropped us off beside a village in the Brown State. Here Carol and I talked with the mother and father of 18 children. The mother was only 36. She had married at 12 and had her first child at 14, followed by the birth of one child each year thereafter. 18 of them had lived. This family was very poor. Their house was small, and they slept seven to a bed. However, they were very proud of their family and the fact that the five eldest sons were in training to be gladiators. The whole family worked as tenant farmers, which did not supply them with enough money to survive. So the two eldest daughters had been working as prostitutes for the past several years to supplement the family income. The whole family was very proud of these two girls. Their health by macro society standards was atrocious. The mother, with two babies at her breasts, looked a pale and sickly fifty, yet she had told me proudly that she was fourteen years younger than that. The father, at thirty-nine, looked younger than the mother, though most of his teeth were rotten stumps and his body looked bloated with unhealthy fat. In contrast, most of the swarming children looked very skinny, but with complexions just as pallid as their parents. When we arrived at their home, they were all happily watching the gladiators fighting on TV, which I learned every family purchased, even if they had no money for anything else. They were pathetically proud of their dyed brown skin, and their brown religion, their brown language, their brown state, which had the bravest and strongest gladiators in the world, according to them. Once again, we got the bit about God creating four races and being disappointed, so he created the brown race to show all the others how to live loyal, courageous, and God-fearing lives. They believed it, and were pathetically happy that they had had the great good fortune to be born God's chosen people. Instead of being scornful of Carol, this family were genuinely sorry for her great misfortune at having been born in the macro society. They honestly pitied this beautiful and healthy young girl. When I asked them if they weren't unhappy with their poverty, the father said, We pity the rich, for they no longer have the glorious hope of obtaining riches. We have the exciting incentive of gaining wealth. Soon our sons will enter the games and the money will begin to roll in. You see, we have every reason to be happy with our lives. Carol and I left on that note, feeling again depressed, but no longer surprised that Elgon would want us to visit as many people as possible. It was becoming obvious that he was showing off the results of the most successful propaganda machine ever created. Later, as we were flying through the Black State, I asked Elgon if he had any idea what the average lifespan was on Micro Island. Yes, he replied, men live to an average of about 53 years, and women about 52. Of course you think that's terrible, but again, let me remind you, John 10, that it's not how long we live or how much comfort or security you have that really counts. No, in the long run, it's how much pride you can take in your life and how much excitement you had along the way. I don't deny, I said, that you've been successful at persuading your people into believing what you're saying. My wonder is that even a hundred a year leave your island. Those are the older ones, Elgon explained, who haven't had the advantages of all the improvements that Sela 9, I, and our thousand controllers have instituted in the past thirty years. I spent the first 40 years here just getting things organized, but now our micro-society is more exciting and interesting than ever before for everyone. You mean it's taken 70 years to set up an almost perfect propaganda machine that persuades everyone into thinking what you want them to think, I observed. Elka merely smiled his imperious smile and suggested that I visit with more families. This we did, but the next two families, one black, one white, gave us the same old story. They were proud of their skin color, their religion, their language, their people, their glorious state. Naturally, they were happy to be God's chosen people, and they were out to produce as many children of their race as possible. The black family had 18 children, while the white family, due to multiple births, was the record holder with 53 children. The incredibly prolific white mother mentioned the growing problem with outlaws who refused to accept the wisdom of Elgon 10 and entertained the blasphemous ideas of the macro society. She said it was the other states that had the biggest problems with this, naturally. I began to suspect that Elgon had landed us close to the safe communities, in which he knew the inhabitants were brainwashed. I was happy to hear that people who were seeking out the ideas of the macro society were a big problem. I did, however, learn some interesting things from the black family. Since father was a lawyer, he explained that next to being a gladiator, being a lawyer was the most prestigious and the best-paying job on Micro Island. This, he said, was because of the masses of conflicting laws. He admitted that there were so many laws covering so many areas of life that everyone broke at least two or three laws every day. Of course, if one had a clever lawyer, there was no problem. 
However, since each state had different laws, it was extremely dangerous to travel into another state. Lawyers couldn't practice in any other state, and you were sure to break some of that other state's laws. Then your different skin color would put you at a tremendous disadvantage. I was fascinated to hear this lawyer defend their legal system, in which the rich could hire lawyers to give them virtual immunity from the law, while the poor were constantly suffering from the lack of legal representation. As he spoke, I realized that their legal system was not much different from that of 1976, where the poor were a hundred times more likely to go to jail than the rich, and where the only ones to ever suffer from capital punishment were the poor. He explained that since the rich were obviously more valuable to the state than the poor, it was only natural that they would be able to buy greater justice. However, he carefully pointed out that the law had no favorites. It was strictly a matter of hiring a good attorney and thus staying in good with the government. I realized that the micro-government of 2150 would applaud the actions of my government back in 1976, which fought inflation by creating unemployment among the poor and allowed a third of its people to live in poverty while it spent billions to support corrupt governments thousands of miles from its shores. But then, like attracts like, and the corrupt governments have always tended to support other corrupt governments. After having visited all five states, Elgon said we were ready to visit the capital city in the center of the island, where all the states came together. During our flight there, I asked Elgon about the island school system. He replied that for almost 90% of the children, formal education started at 5 and ended at 12. Full-time work in the fields, factories, and stores began at this age, along with the universal obligation to marry and start having children. It was possible to continue formal education in the gladiator, law, or medical schools if sufficient tests were passed. Since these schools were open at night, young people who passed the test could work during the day and study at night. The wealthy had no problems, for they could hire teachers to guarantee successful passing of all the tests except those of the gladiators. When I asked about the state and local governments, I discovered that only lawyers could hold governmental positions, sometimes as many as four or five of them at a time. As for Elgon's national island government, all 10,000 positions were appointed by Elgon or Sela, and the most important of these, over a 1,000 positions, were filled with ex-members of the macro society. I commented on this, saying you obviously value the macro society environment in that it produced your best and most trusted leaders. Doesn't this contradict what you are saying about micro island? After all, if life was so good here, it ought to produce your best leaders. Elgon laughed at this and said, as long as the macro society develops individuals with macro powers who later get so bored and fed up with life there that they want to join us here, then I won't have to worry about setting up tutoring systems here to develop those powers. But obviously you don't get people with highly developed macro powers or you wouldn't consider me at 10th level when I'm really only 2nd level, I observed. Elgon merely changed the subject by pointing ahead to his capital city of Algonia. Take a look at it, he said, and realize it's the only large city in the world because the macro society refuses to allow its members the joys of city living. I looked down and saw a very small city compared with 1976 standards, for it had only 30,000 inhabitants, and a quarter of these worked for Elgon's government. Over 100,000 people worked in Elgonia, but since the presidential territory of approximately 10 miles in diameter was stateless, most workers preferred to live in their states and commute. There were many government buildings in the center of the city surrounding magnificent presidential palace that looked somewhat like the Taj Mahal of India. Elgon Ten was obviously very proud of his capital city and talked at some length on the importance of its strong central government. He rattled off a long list of governmental agencies, such as the Agency of Agriculture, Commerce, Labor, Games, Law, Education, and Intelligence, to name a few. I was particularly interested in the fact that Elgon had nine different intelligence agencies for gathering information about his people. When I questioned him about their functions, however, he replied that intelligence agencies functioned best when their operations were completely secret, and therefore we couldn't talk about them, even to me. Then he surprised me by saying, However, John Ten, as soon as you join our government, I'll make you a vice president and tell you all about our intelligence operations. Thank you, Elgon Ten, I said, declining his invitation, but I plan to remain in the macro society. He laughed a big booming laugh and said, You still think that someone who grew up in the micro society of the 20th century can live happily in the macro society? Believe me, John Ten, if I who spent my first 50 years in the macro society couldn't stand it, you won't be able to either. It was your pride and your desire for personal power that made you dislike the macro society, Carol said to Elgon. 
John doesn't want personal power, so your offer of high position in your government doesn't interest him. Elgon's face tightened its granite hardness, and I became aware of a heightened redness in his aura. However, he remained calm and replied to Carol that she was too young to understand the delights of microexistence. Our transair landed in the beautiful courtyard of the presidential palace where Elgon insisted on giving us a personally guided tour of his glittering domain. As we walked through his gardens, my enjoyment of their beauty was marred by my memory of the faces of dozens of poorly fed children we had seen during the day. Finally, I interrupted Elgon to ask how the people managed to produce such huge families. He explained that people could buy fertility pills that would ensure multiple births. Large families were not only a source of great pride and a religious and state duty, but also an economic advantage, since children of twelve or over could earn money and become gladiators or prostitutes. An hour later, I had seen enough of the lavishly appointed rooms, hallways, courtyards filled with rare and precious possessions that Elgon and Sela doted on. Elgon recognized my growing restlessness and escorted us to a sumptuous suite of rooms which he said I could occupy as long as I wished. Then he and Sela left us alone with a reminder that they would see us at dinner. Once we were alone, I threw myself onto the giant canopied bed and said, I'm tired of Michael Island already and I'm especially tired of Elgon 10 and Sela 9. Let's take a quick nap so we can get through the evening. Carol didn't reply immediately, and I saw that she was standing pensively, chewing on her lower lip. For the first time, I saw the sparkling pink in her aura give way to the red of anxiety. I reached out to establish some mind contact and discovered her mental struggle with some sort of doubt that she kept trying to hide from me. Please, Carol, I pleaded. Tell me what's bothering you. I've never known you to try to hide your thoughts from me. She shook her head slowly and finally, with a sigh of resignation, said, It's going to start sooner than Raina thought. Then she looked away from me. Okay, Carol, don't keep me in suspense, I implored. What's going to happen sooner than Raina thought? I'm not sure, she answered, taking my hand. Raina thought they would wait two or three days before putting heavy pressure on you, but I have a strong premonition that something unpleasant is going to happen very soon. I thought that Carol's precognitive power was much more sensitive than mine, so I said, Are you sure you don't have any idea what this unpleasantness is going to be? Carol looked at me for a long moment, then with a soft cry she buried her face in my shoulder. A moment later we were devouring each other with kisses. Soon our desire for greater oneness was more than we could resist, and slipping out of our tunics we began the joyous love play that only too closely attuned souls can ever really know. Suddenly, with clear audience awareness, I could hear the beat of our soul notes mounting in intensity as our bodies and minds sought ever closer oneness till we attained the ecstasy of macro immersion. Later, as we swam lazily about in the mammoth sunken pool of our bathroom, I remembered that Carol had never answered my last question about her premonition. I decided that if she didn't want to tell me, I wouldn't press her. Immediately upon making this decision, I received her telepathic note of thanks. Back in our bedroom, we discovered that our aura-reflecting tunics had been replaced by a beautiful golden tunic covered with flashing jewels for Carol and a gleaming white fabric one for me. Carol seemed to have recovered her usual sunny disposition and, having quickly donned her new tunic, was complaining about its inordinate weight when five male servants, representing each of the five races of the micro-states, came to escort us to dinner. The dining room in Elgon's palace was large enough to easily accommodate two standard-sized football fields placed side by side, and it was almost completely filled with men and women in stunningly handsome uniforms and beautifully lavish gowns. We were escorted to a raised platform at one end of this room, where Elgon and Sela were sitting at a small table facing the other, much longer tables in this vast dining room. It had been filled with the sounds of many voices when we entered, but now it was becoming quiet. By the time Elgon and Sela had seated Carol and me between them, the great room was gripped in a funeral-like silence, and somehow my mind felt like it was in a giant vice that was slowly, inexorably, being squeezed tighter and tighter. I became aware of Elgon making a speech of welcome in my honor, but my head felt like bands of steel were crushing it. I realized dimly that Carol, too, was suffering this mind pressure. The rest of the evening was a blur of interminable dishes of strange foods being served along with different beverages, most of which I rarely sampled. I was aware of Elgon and Sela talking to me, and that I obviously gave appropriate responses, for they seemed to be very pleased. 
but I have no memory of what anyone has said. The last thing I remember of that evening was following our five servant escorts back to our room, where Carol and I immediately lay down on our bed without even removing our clothes. I found myself back in 1976 groping for the nightlight, which revealed that it was three o'clock in the morning. I was not able to banish the dark fear in my mind. Why was I so frightened, I wondered. Nothing had happened to either Carol or me which would account for my strange feeling of anxiety and dread. I shook my head in an attempt to clear it and remembered the feeling of great pressure around my head during that dinner with Elgon. I wondered what had caused that excruciating sensation that had effectively blocked out most of my awareness during dinner. As I pondered this question, I felt the answer beginning to rise to consciousness from great depths within my mind. I waited until a picture of the dining room began to form in my mind. This picture was filled with hundreds of faces which were empty, except for a single eye brightly staring at me from many foreheads. It was the symbol of the telepathic mind net which Elgon had focused on me again. But why? Why did I still feel a crushing sense of anxiety and fear? Then I felt almost overwhelmed by a driving need to return to 2150 and discover if Carol was all right. Of course, the harder I tried to put myself asleep, the more awake I became until I realized that I must calm myself by balancing my mind with acceptance of what is as perfect. Failing that, I attempted macro contact recall. A few minutes later, having succeeded in this attempt, I slipped gently into sleep and awakened back in 2150 to find myself lying alone, still dressed, in the great canopied bed. I was on my feet instantly, running through the five huge rooms of our suite, calling Carol's name, but there was no answer. I decided to find Elgon and demand an explanation. As I plunged into the hallway, I came face to face with at least 30 ex-members of the Macro Society who were easily recognized by their great size. I asked them to tell me where I could find Elgon 10, but they made no reply. I only stared intently into my eyes. Then again I felt the great vice exert almost blinding pressure on my skull. I quickly staggered back into my room, desperately closing the doors between me and those penetrating eyes. The pressure on my mind was still increasing, and I found it difficult to maintain consciousness. I staggered back to the bed, falling full length upon it. Suddenly I realized that my mind had become disconnected from my body and realized what it must be like to suffer total paralysis. I became aware of others in my room and that I was being undressed. Then I felt myself being carried into the bathroom and hurled into the deep end of the sunken pool. I sank quickly below the surface and began to see how long I could hold my breath while at the same time struggling to overcome my strange paralysis. I'm not sure how long I continued this futile struggle, but eventually I began to realize that I would have to use my PK powers to float my body to the surface with my face above the water. Once I began concentrating on this effort, I discovered that my paralysis was quickly leaving me. My head broke the surface of the water. Whether Elgon's telepathic mind net had released me, I did not know, but now my paralysis was completely gone. I swam easily about, taking deep breaths of precious air into my lungs. When I returned to the bedroom, I found Sela lying naked on top of my bed. She was obviously amused at my startled expression, for she laughed and said, Don't look so surprised, John Ten. Elgon Ten and I have decided that if you are going to learn to appreciate the unique virtues of Micro Island, then you should be permitted to sample its greatest pleasure, me. As she said this last word, she arched her lush naked body so that her huge firm breasts were thrust invitingly straight at me. She rolled the tip of her pink tongue over her full red lips, leaving them glistening in quivering wetness. Then she began to slowly undulate her pelvis and breathe in short, panting breaths. Suddenly, my mind was again gripped in the crushing vice of a thousand-mind telepathic net which Elgon directed. I lost control of my body and watched, horrified, as it took on a life of its own and walked over to the bed, climbed into Sela's arms, and began caressing her body. At that moment, my body returned to its control, and I became fully aware of the awesome, sensuous power of the velvety, voluptuous body which now clung to me in a fervid, passionate embrace. For a long moment I burned with lust that seemed to consume all of the desires. I felt myself sinking into a bottomless sea of red, dark waves. If I had never experienced macro-immersion, and if I had not now remembered the infinite perfection of my embrace with my twin soul, Leah, I am sure that Sela would have won. From then on, I would have followed her about as a dog follows a bitch in heat. But as I teetered on the brink of that sea of lust, 
my mind filled to overflowing with a picture of my beloved Leah. I thrust a manically screaming Selah away from me and left the bed, walked about the room, and seated myself in one of the high-backed ornate chairs. Leah and I had won the first battle. For a few moments, Selah flung herself about on the bed and gave vent to screaming, howling rage. Then suddenly the storm passed, and she was sitting up smiling at me, saying, Next time, John Ten, it will be my turn to win, and you can be sure there will be a next time. I shook my head. No, Selah, I said. Algon's telepathic mind net with its thousand minds may take over my mind, my body, and force it to touch you. I know, Selah. But my mind will never choose to wallow in temporal micro-pleasures, which are all you have to offer. For a moment her eyes burned with dark lights, and then she looked away and said, I am Selah Nine. You seem to have forgotten your manners. Have you also forgotten your Alpha Mate Carol Three? No, I haven't, I said. But are you willing to tell me what you and Elgon Ten have done with her? Telepathically, I picked up from Selah's mind only that Carol had been drugged and was being held somewhere in the palace. I was not about to admit that I even knew this. Before Selah answered me, the door opened and Elgon entered the room, accompanied by three female servants who went immediately to Selah and began helping her into a jewel-encrusted tunic. I was still naked and asked that my own tunic be returned to me. Elgon merely smiled and said, Only Microman feels uncomfortable when he's naked. Had you already forgotten? I ignored this and asked when I would see Carol. That, Elgon replied, depends on how soon you will allow us to help you complete your time translation. Why is it so important to you to complete my time translation? I asked. Elgon laughed and said, I'm sure you must know that as the first person to transcend time, you occupy a mentally created human physical body. You are now famous. We know that the Macro Society has denied you permanent time translation unless you attain third-level awareness, which is impossible in the time available. The people of Micro Island will be pleased to save a fellow micro-being. And you'll be happy to thwart the Macro Society, I replied. Of course, he answered. But now we will leave you to think over how soon you want us to help you become a permanent resident on Micro Island. That will be never, I answered. Again, he laughed and said, I wouldn't be too sure of that, John Ten. I have a precognitive hunch that you'll change your mind before the next two weeks are over. He turned and walked to the door, accompanied by Sela and her three servants. As he walked out of the room, he called back to me over his shoulder, saying, You might watch the video screen in your room, John Ten. It will help you pass the time. With these words, the door closed behind him, and I noticed the six-foot square video screen on the wall opposite the bed had been activated. On it, I saw a picture of Carol lying on the floor of a barren room. I was across the room with a bound, examining the video picture more closely. Carol was dressed as she had been at the dinner the previous evening. She was obviously unconscious, but with her hands folded across her chest, and with the absence of color in the black and white picture, she gave the appearance of being dead. At first, there had been no sound associated with this picture, but now the audio came on with Elgon's voice saying, Your friend Carol Three is in a drug-induced catatonic trance. She will remain in this state until you choose to cooperate with us or until she dies. The audio portion ended with this message, but the picture remained as a constant reminder of Elgon's threat. For the rest of the day, I wandered about in my suite of five rooms trying to think of some way to rescue Carol and get back to the macro society. I tried to make mind contact with Carol's subconscious mind, but Elgon's telepathic mind net always stopped me, as they did when I twice attempted to go outside the hallway. I didn't feel desperate, however, because I was convinced that if I asked for help from the macro society, their superior macro powers would free us both from Elgon's control. By late evening, I was beginning to feel depressed by the sight of Carol's unconscious body on the video screen. I had taken two food tablets during the day, so I wasn't hungry, but nevertheless, I had a hollow sinking feeling inside of me that seemed like a premonition of death. But whose death? Carol's or mine? Or both? Finally, I decided to go to sleep so I could return to 1976 and talk my situation over with Carl, my guardian, and Nada. I went to sleep, but didn't awaken in 1976. I had a dream. In this dream, I was lying in the barren room beside Carol's body. I seemed to be paralyzed because no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't move any part of my body. At last, exhausted from my efforts, I lay back and stared at the face of Leah, which had appeared floating above me. I telepathically asked for help, but she shook her head, saying, Think carefully, John, before you ask for help. 
I must remind you that if we help you, it will be impossible for you to attain third-level awareness soon enough for us to complete your time translation. All right, I said, but then help Carol. Take her back to the mainland. Again, Leah shook her head and said, I can't do that unless she requests it. And so far, she has asked to remain with you, even if it means her death. Then I found myself suddenly awake back in 1976, shouting, Don't let her die, Leah. Don't let her die. 